thank you all for joining us for the first in this series of lectures for the 2018 Knauss Fellow uh, Brown Bag Series. Uh, my name is James Murphy. I'm a C Grant Fellow with Hawaii C Grant up with OER uh, here at NOAA. And our speaker today is Lisa Peterson. Uh, Lisa is a Knauss Fellow with NOAA Fisheries Office of Science Technology, working with Brett Elder on electronic technologies. She's from Royal Oak, Michigan and did her BS, MS, and is currently finishing up her PhD at Michigan State University in the Department of Fisheries and Wildlife. She work, has worked on Lake Erie, Yellow Perch, and Walleye Stock Assessment Models, as well as Great Lake Acoustics Telemetry Data. And a fun fact about Lisa, she's been to 48 of the 50 states with the help of family vacations and a pop-up while she was growing up. She's just missing Oregon and Alaska. So without ado, further ado, let's welcome Lisa Peterson. <laughs> All right, hello everyone and a lot of Canass fellows. Um, it's funny, I was going to start this off with an introduction of myself, but that was pretty good, so uh, I guess I won't dwell on that. Um, but as you can tell by the title, um, we're going to be talking about the Great Lakes today, um, which might be a little new for some of you. Um, I'm pleased to be going back to my freshwater roots to talk about my PhD work. Um, and so today I'm going to be talking about one component of my PhD, which was looking at acoustic telemetry data to estimate mortality, um, pretty much focused on walleye in Lake Erie. Uh, so I think that this will be a learning experience for a fair amount of you. Um, and also I think some of this work is just a good example of how some collaborative research can really generate some interesting projects and interesting output. So hopefully you'll enjoy it and I have should have plenty of time for questions at the end. Um, so feel free to treat this as my practice defense. Uh, so feel free to grill me. Um, okay. So I want to emphasize that this is not work that I've done here at NOAA. This was work that I did while with Michigan State University. Um, and that work involved a lot of partners, um, including uh, obviously Michigan State University and the Quantitative Fishery Center within which I worked, um, as well as GLaDOS, the Great Lakes Acoustic Telemetry Observation System, which I will talk more about um, in this talk. Um, a lot of work with the Great Lakes Fishery Commission, a little bit with the USGS, and also some help from the Great Lakes Observing System. But first, let's orient you. Okay, let's see if I can get the pointer working. Yes. Okay, so I have this image of North America, um, and we're going to be talking about this little lake in here, part of the Laurentian Great Lakes, Lake Erie. So let's zoom in a little bit. Um, so there's acoustic telemetry work being done in all of the Great Lakes, um, but my focus has been on Lake Erie. Uh, lake Erie is my favorite lake because it gets to be this pretty color sometimes um, with some of the algae blooms that I'm sure most of you have heard about. Um, but so this is the southernmost and most productive of the Laurentian Great Lakes. Um, and you can see just from the satellite image that there is somewhat of a gradient from west to east across the lake um, where you have very productive waters and warm waters in the west and it gets cooler, deeper, and less productive as you move out to the east. Um, and within this lake, there is a very important fish species known as walleye. This is not walleye pollock, this is walleye, Sander vitreus, um, which is uh, part of the Persid family, um, so related to yellow perch, if you've heard of them. They are a medium-sized fish. They grow up to be around uh, 30 inches. And they're found all over Lake Erie, and they're very, very valuable as a recreational species um, in the US, and also very valuable as a commercial species in Canada. So again, to reorient you, this is Ontario, Canada, up here on the top of Lake Erie. And we have four states that connect into Lake Erie and have fishermen that go in and fish for this species um, of walleye. So, in Lake Erie, walleye is managed binationally um, through, well, each state, you know, allocates its own uh, quota, uh, but there is this binational commission that comes together, or committee that comes together, the Lake Erie Committee, with representatives from all the states in Canada, and they have a stock assessment model uh, that gets performed, a statistical catch-at-age model, 
And with that model, uh, a total allowable catch is designated every year for walleye, and that is allocated out to the different jurisdictions. Um, so I'm giving you this background because I want to emphasize that walleye is very important, and it's also being looked at by a variety of models to see what the status of Lake Erie is and how many fish there could be in the next year, because that's how you set the total allowable catch. Um, so it's definitely a species of interest. It's very valuable economically, and it's very I find it very tasty. I've, I've heard it tastes weird to some other people, but I find it delicious. Um, and it is one of the target species of um, the Acoustic Telemetry Projects, which is what I've been involved in. Um, so here's my obligatory picture of me with a fish. You can't have a talk like this without having a picture of me with a fish. Um, so that's me with a walleye that we had just tagged using a elect or we had just caught using an electrofishing boat. Um, and I'll get more into that in a second. So I want to continue orienting you to my work um, by describing what acoustic telemetry is. Um, because uh, when I came out here, I where's Andrew in the audience, uh, we were excited. We thought we worked on similar things. Um, but she was working with a different type of acoustics than I was. Um, so, and it's quite a bit different. So acoustic telemetry is basically electronic tagging. Um, and there are two components to this. There are tags and there are receivers. Um, so I'm gonna kind of just walk you through um, a tagging event and a receiver deployment event to give you an idea of how this works. So first you get in all green, obviously that's very necessary. You put your awesome looking waders on um, and then you go electrofishing or you catch the fish in some way in this case, you know. So I went out once, took a bunch of pictures and I like using all the pictures in every presentation I give. So there's another me with the walleye picture. Um, but so you'll catch, you catch a fish and then you implant an electronic tag into the body cavity of the fish and you suture that. And then you also usually have an external tag on it. And so this is for when fishermen catch this fish, they can look at this external external tag and know that it has been tagged um, electronically and there's a phone number to call and actually there's a reward if you return the electronic tag. So if you're ever fishing in Lake Erie and catch a walleye like this, uh, be sure not to waste the $100 that you can get by calling it in. Um, but so after this tagging occurs, uh, the fish are re-released into the body of water um, and now they're swimming around with this electronic tag inside of them that is constantly emitting an electronic signal. And so what picks up that electronic signal are receivers. Um, so this is an image of one of the receivers that we were using in Lake Erie. Um, the receivers are usually put in some sort of uh, flotation device and then anchored to um, the bottom of the water column. Uh, and then they are released into um, Lake Erie <laughs> or your study area, wherever your acoustic telemetry is happening. Um, so now you have these receivers in place where if a tagged fish swims within a certain radius, this receiver will detect it. Um, and so when you collect this data and download it, you have you know a database of where the fish was at specific times. So that's you can imagine that that can be useful for a lot of different things, both from looking at the movement of the fish and habitat use, um, as well as mortality, which is what my project is. So that's acoustic telemetry in a nutshell, essentially. All right, so now let's talk about acoustic telemetry in the Great Lakes. So this is what I was referring to when I talked about kind of a successful example of a collaborative or a collaboration that really led to um, you know, better research and more data being available for research and science. So just a history of acoustic telemetry in the Great Lakes. The Great Lakes Restoration Initiative gave funding to the Great Lakes Fishery Commission um, to start acoustic telemetry projects. Um, and see, we have acronyms in the Great Lakes as well. It's not just a federal government thing. We have those as well. Um, and so this um, started a few different projects on a few different species, but there were some immediate challenges. Um, amounts of receivers for each individual project, um, also data sharing, uh, because one, so a receiver will detect a fish if, if it has been tagged, even if it's not part of your, su your study. Um, so 
data sharing was an immediate, you know, concern of people because if you had, you know, you tagged a walleye here and maybe these were your um, receiver for your project and it swam, you know, up, uh, up into Lake Huron and maybe those were from a different project, uh, you would want to know that if it was detected on those receivers, obviously. Um, but since these were started as like different disparate projects happening, that was one of the challenges they were facing. So it all really comes down to communication. Um, so some smart people in the Great Lakes uh, came up with a solution for this. Um, and that led to the Great Lakes Acoustic Telemetry Observation System, GLaDOS, <laughs> which I will now be referring to as GLaDOS because that's much easier to say. Um, and so this uh, system is really a network of researchers doing acoustic telemetry in the Great Lakes. So this brought all the different projects together to really facilitate the collaboration between them and just the communication between them. Um, so there's an annual meeting every year where everyone gets together and you know talks about best best practices and lessons learned and you know sharing of equipment in some cases. Um, and it's also led to uh, a basically depository of acoustic telemetry data being um, generated. Uh, so that all the data is coming into the same place. Um, and so if you look, so this is an image of the receivers um, when the projects were first starting, and this is an image of the receiver distribution as it stands today. Um, so you can see the expansion into more of the Great Lakes, as well as you can see my favorite lake, Lake Erie, is now pretty well covered in receivers. <laughs> Um, so, and this has, this really grew out of this GLaDOS collaboration, um, and it has led to this database of, oh, excuse me, of detections with, you know, many different species of fish, including walleye, obviously, and uh, many different detections. Uh, so, I think last time I checked, there was around 40 million detections inside the GLaDOS database. So, a lot of data um, is being generated by this network of researchers. And so that's kind of the impetus beh behind my work. Oh, and also there's a website if you want to check it out. Um, you can see maps like this on there and also learn about the different projects. But so <clears throat> that's kind of the background of where the data came from for, for my project. Um, but as I mentioned, you know, 15 minutes ago at the start of this, the focus with my work is on mortality. Um, so I wanted to just have a slide about why we care about mortality, which, you know, I'm sure most of you are familiar with, but um, knowing the mortality of a fish species can really increase our understanding of the dynamics of that fish species. Um, and it's also tends to be a critical component of stock assessment models, which are then critical for management decisions. Um, so for example, as I mentioned, walleye in Lake Erie are managed through a statistical catch at age model that uses an assumed value for the natural mortality of walleye in Lake Erie. Um, and so there has been some questions about how accurate that measure is and are there other ways to come up with an estimate of natural mortality that may be more robust or just give us another look at how close we are to the actual mortality of walleye in Lake Erie. So that's where my project came from. Now on to what I'm actually going to talk to you about today, um, which is kind of the first component of this project. So acoustic telemetry, you know, has been around for a while, but the idea of using it to estimate population dynamic parameters is more of a new idea. Um, so there's not really a set way to, you know, take the acoustic telemetry data and turn it into a mortality estimate particularly when it's of this sort where it's not, where you have receivers just sitting in the water, you're not going out and finding every fish every, um, every time step or something like that. Um, so the first big challenge of my project was to come up with methods for using acoustic telemetry data to estimate mortality. Um, and, you know, I think they're great methods, but obviously you needed a way to evaluate these different methods. Um, and so I used a simulation framework to then evaluate these different um, approaches. 
And so those two things are what I'm going to be talking to you about for the rest of our time together today. So let's start with that first bullet, is uh, developing the methodology. So for those of you who don't care about models, zone out right now. Um, we have a few slides to go, only a couple with equations, so I promise it won't be too painful. All right, so, and some images for visual learners as I am. Um, so with this work, I came up with two baseline models. Um, one, which was a non-spatial approach. Um, so this was essentially just using the detections of the walleye in the lake without having the spatial data being used in the model. Um, and I'll get more into that in a second. But this, I used a pretty classic um, tagging, mo tagging model called the Cormac Jolly Seaver model. But then I wanted to kind of go to the other end of the spectrum and actually use the spatial data, because that's one of the cool things about acoustic telemetry data, is you have these locations in space of approximately where the fish was in time. So I also wanted to use a spatial approach. And that model uh, is often called a spatial marker capture model. Um, and so I'll get into the structure of that model in a second. But so that's, that's the essentials that I looked at, was one non-spatial model and one spatial model. So a little bit more details um, about those two different models. Um, so the non-spatial model, as I mentioned, is really a classic marker capture model. If any of you are familiar with using tagging data, I'm sure you've heard of the Cormac Jolly Seaver model. Um, but to use the acoustic telemetry data within this model, I basically treated detections as recapture events for a specified time period. Um, and then in this model, the major components are a survival rate, which then I related back to mortality, and a detection probability. So I find it easier to understand these models by thinking about what the data actually looks like when you're putting it into it. Um, so now I have a slide on that. But don't try to read this. Um, it's also very small, so you probably can't read it. But this is, would be like a download from that GLaDOS website of acoustic detections. So that's what that data would look like. And to put it into the non-spatial model, you take this and you turn it into a matrix of ones and zeros. Um, so for each column, that represents a time step. Um, and for each row, that represents an individual fish. And within each box then, a one represents that the fish was detected at some point during that time step. Um, and a zero represents that it was not detected. So, and then this is what you then feed into your Cormac Jolly Seaver model. Um, and the way that works is, those are a little off, but you see you have, having the ones and zeros makes it so you have a discrete number of possible detection histories, you know, the combination of ones and zeros. And so the model uses the mortality or the survival rate and the detection probability then to estimate the amount of fish that would have each of those detection probabilities, or each of those um, detection histories. Um, and then it estimates those two parameters. So that's how that model works. <laughs> Trevor, I'm. Is the detection hearing on the receiver, or is there a gap in time? I can't hear you, I'm sorry. Were they mobile? Would the fish would be mobile, or would they hang out with the receiver? Like, the gap in time was a detection on the receiver? The count and detection. So. Any receiver that, yeah, any receiver that detects it, and no matter how many times it was detected, or how many or how few, it all, it got a one in the matrix. Okay. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. Um, I'm supposed to recap the question. So the question was, um, did you have to have a new receiver detect a fish um, in the time step to have it get a one in the matrix? Um, and it, you didn't. So even if the fish was hanging out at one receiver the whole year, it would get a one each month that it was detected by, even if it was the same receiver. <laughs> okay. So um, there's a lot of um, good things about this model. It's flexible. Uh, so while I showed you kind of a two parameter model, you can, you know, adjust that to be more cohort. So if you have more fish being tagged through time, this model is very easily able to account for that. Um, you can also have time varying parameters um, and you can have parameters that are functions of other parameters. It's, it's very able to um, 
be a little bit more complex. Uh, and also, this model has a much quicker runtime than the more complicated spatial model. Um, I think I'll come back to that. But you know, these types of models could be run in 10 minutes. Um, so for those of you who are run models, that's very quick. <laughs> All right, now uh, to the spatial model. Because so I'm not sure characterizing this as a drawback is the right word, but I really wanted to have another model that took into account that spatial data. Because that's one of the cool things about acoustic telemetry is you have that spatial information. So I also developed a spatial marker capture model. Um, so this model is more complex, as you would think. Um, and there's basically, I think of it having three components, where you have an observation model, you have a state model, which is like the state of the fish, whether it's alive or dead. And underneath both those is a point process model. Um, and this is often called an activity center in the literature. Um, and essentially what this means is that for every time step, uh, the fish could be you know, moving and being detected at a bunch of different receivers. But this point is estimated, this activity center is estimated as essentially the center of its activity. Good name. Um, the center of where the fish has been detected during that time step. And so that location then influences the detection probability of receivers. So for example, if a receiver is close to that activity center, it'll have a higher detection probability than a receiver that's far away from that activity center. And I'll show you some equations which will either clear it up or make it muddier. OK, so this is my one like equation slide. Um, so again, you have this observation model, and that's based on the data. So and this is different here, because instead of you know, just using whether it was detected or not, you're using what fish it is, um, where it was detected. So each individual receiver is included in the model and what time step it was detected at. And then that observation model is conditional on the state model. Um, and, the, um, and the state model is where, yep, just have to hold it now. Um, <clears throat> the state model is where that mortality comes in. So this is, again, the state of the fish. How likely is it that it's alive? And there's two components of that. Um, you have the mortal or the survival, which then gets related back to mortality, and then Z, which is um, the whether the fish is alive or dead. And so these two things are then connected to a point process model. Um, so again, the observation model conditional on the state model is then assumed to be drawn from a Poisson distribution with these three parameters. Thank you. All right, so P0 is a baseline detection rate. Um, so that is the detection rate if a fish is sitting on top of the receiver. Um, or the activity center is sitting on top of the receiver. And then G is the general distance function. So this is where the spatial information comes into play. Um, so with this, I use a half normal um, distance function, um, which is pretty common. If anyone's familiar with like citability models, it's a similar idea to that. Um, but so this equation controls um, uh, how quickly the detection probability of a receiver goes down as it gets farther away from the estimated activity center. And you can see that because so um, D within this equation is the distance from the receiver to the activity center. Um, and then also included in that is the state model or is the, the state of the fish. OK, so <laughs> that's the equation slide. So let's look at the data. So this is the same, the same screenshot of GLaDOS data, although it's bigger. Still don't try to read it. Um, so to put this data into a spatial model, you have, instead of a uh, matrix, you have a 3D array. So you basically have a whole bunch of different matrices. And each matrix represents a time period. And then again, each row is each fish, but now each column is each receiver. And then in the box, instead of having that one or a zero, you have the counts of how many times it was detected at each receiver for that time period. Um, and this is just example data, um, but I wanted to have that big range um, because 
as Trevor alluded to with his question, sometimes fish kind of just hang out at a receiver and it might get detected a whole bunch of times. Um, you know, whereas if it just swims by, it might only get detected once or a couple times. Or So you can get a fairly wide range of counts of detections uh, within this 3D array. So in this model is taking that into account. Okay, so those are my two models that I developed to estimate mortality. Um, and so now I needed to evaluate these approaches and I decided to use the simulation framework. So now we're gonna talk about the fish that live in my computer. Um, so the beautiful thing about simulations is that you can essentially create data where you know what the truth is. So in this case, you know, you're generating acoustic telemetry data but you're generating it from a population where I know what the mortality rate is because I set it. Um, and so you can then put that data into your models, have it estimate mortality, and see how close that estimate gets to that truth that you know. Um, and this simulation framework um, is a little bit more unique because this is essentially an individual based simulation model. So what that means is for each individual simulation, I generated movement paths for 200 fish over three years. Um, and so this uh, was from a lot of help from one of my co-authors, uh, Chris Holbrook, so I wanted to give him a shout out. But what is happening here is so for each individual fish, we have a um, <coughs> tagging release site, which is right here. And then the fish essentially has just a random walk where it's moving around the lake. And the speed here of the fish is approximately, or makes it so it's approximately going around the lake as much as an actual walleye might also. But this is not supposed to represent actual walleye because if anyone knows about walleye, they have migratory patterns. So these fish do not have migratory, uh, migratory patterns and a big, Part of why I did that was I wanted this analysis to be a little bit more general than the specific case of walleye, although it is in Lake Erie. <laughs> um, so to add a little bit more randomness to the movement of these fish, I basically had two cohorts of fish where 100 of the fish were moving in patterns relatively similar to this, and then the other half of the 200 fish were more homebodies. So they tended to stay in the Western basin of Lake Erie for most of the time period. And so this was just to represent how in some species of fish you have cords that stay near to the spawning grounds and some fish that move a little bit more. Um, so there were 200 of these <laughs> in each simulation and those 200 movement paths then I used pretty much standard tag uh, specifications to then generate um, transmissions of acoustic tags for each of these movement paths. Oh yeah, and so I also had different mortality rates for um, the different scenarios. So I looked at three different mortality rates, 0 0.1, 0 0.4, and 0.6, just to look at a range of how the models performed with low and higher mortality. So then on top of those movement paths, you then put over your receiver distributions. So I looked at four different receiver distributions. I looked at 64 receivers in a grid and 39 receivers in a grid. And then I also looked at more of a gate um, receiver distribution, uh, which is sometimes used as the study design, especially if you think that fish will tend to move one direction and then come back the other way. This is a way to try to for sure capture that movement. Um, so I looked at, again, same amounts of receivers, 64 receivers and 39 receivers. Um, and so with these four different receiver configurations, um, this incorporated also a, um, a probability of actually being detected. So you'd have those fish moving around the lake, and if they came within a certain range of the receivers, there was a probability that they would get detected. Um, and so if they were detected, that would then be generated into my acoustic telemetry data set created from this population of fish where I knew what the mortality rate was. So again, I had 200 fish in each simulation. I looked at three different mortality rates. 
and I looked at four different receiver configurations. So just again, visually, <laughs> I had three different types of populations of fish where they had different mortality rates. Those all went into each of the different receiver configurations and then that generated a database of detections. Those all went into the model and then I used Bayesian inference, or both models, I used Bayesian inference to come up with the estimates for each of these configurations. So that resulted in 12 uh, estimates of mortality, and then I replicated that 10 times. So that's how I generated the data that, or the results that you're about to see. All right, so. Now we're going to step through this a little bit slow because this is just going to have everything on it. Um, so this will cover the whole gamut. Um, you know, don't want to use too many slides. So we're just going to use a lot of points and a lot of areas on the plots. So let's step through this first one a little bit slowly. Um, so right now you can only see uh, four sets of points. Um, and each set of points represents a specific um, receiver configuration. Um, so the open circles represent 64 receivers in a grid. Closed circles represent 39 receivers in a grid. Open triangles represent 64 receivers in a line. Closed triangles represent 39 receivers in lines. So grids, lines. Um, and then each of these, there's going to be another set of four that will show up to the right of this. And both of those are from populations of fish that were experiencing a mortality of 0.1. So you're going to have two more show up over here for 0.4, and two more are going to show up here for 0.6. So this first, one more, one more aspect of it before I let you see more. So this first box on the left, this first set of points, are for the results from the non-spatial model. So this was non-spatial. This next set that's going to show up is for the spatial model results. Um, but so immediately when you just look at this set, um, you can see you have a little bit of a positive bias, or not a little bit, you have a very consistent positive bias with all 10 replicates of each of these um, configurations. Meaning, oh yeah, that's the other thing I should explain is the y-axis. Okay, so we're looking at proportion error. So this is essentially the observed mortality rate, so this is the estimated mortality rate from the model, minus the true mortality rate all over the true mortality rate. So this is proportion error. So if it's, if it's a positive number, it's um, overestimating. The model is coming up with an estimate that's higher than the true one. And if it's a negative number, it's underestimating. Okay, so non-spatial results. Let's throw up the spatial results. So again, these are the same set of configurations, just these are results from the spatial model. Um, and you can see that for both the spatial, the spatial and non-spatial results, the grid with more receivers is doing fairly well. Um, you have that consistent positive bias, so you would like to see it more centered around zero, but it's all around, except for this one outlier, it's all around 25 percent or lower, 20.25 proportion error or lower. Um, but you can see that when you look at the uh, simulations with less receivers or in a line receivers, it starts to perform more poorly. Um, and also with this non-spatial model, you can see this pretty consistent, um, the 64 line and the 39 line both do similarly, and they both are doing pretty poorly and positively um, biased. So if we look at sim uh, simulations where the mortality was a little bit higher, so 0.4, you can see these are all on the same axis. So you can see that this these start to perform better and more consistently than the 0.1 mortality, true mortality. Um, and when we put up 0.6, you can see that even more. Um, so for me, this was exciting because I wasn't sure what we were going to get out of this, whether the models would, how they were going to behave. Um, and so seeing, you know, some of these centered more around zero made me feel good. Um, but so 
but kind of other conclusions from this are that it's the difference between 0.1 mortality and 0.4 and 0.6 is fairly stark, especially with the lines and the spatial model results, where it seems to be better at estimating higher rates of mortality. So just to recap, the models, um, in my opinion, are able to estimate mortality rates reasonably well. The grids do seem to perform better than the lines, um, although one other interesting thing I thought from this was that if you look at the spatial model, the, 60, the line configuration with more receivers sometimes was outperforming the grid configuration with less receivers. Um, so that could imply that if you are setting up your receivers in a line for other reasons, like you're answering more than just mortality questions with your study, um, that using a spatial model might be a better way to estimate mortality. Um, and I think this is because since you're using, well, since you're using the location of the receivers in space, the spatial model knows that you have receivers that are far apart from each other. Um, so when a fish disappears off, you know, from, stops being detected, not actually disappears, but stops being detected, the model will not immediately assume that it's gone because it will know that these, um, that the farther spaced apart receivers will have a lower detection probability. Okay, but big thing, the grids do tend to perform better than the lines. Um, having more receivers uh, did pretty consistently mean that you were having better estimates. Um, all of the models did have that positive bias, um, so it, you were overestimating the true mortality rate. Um, and if I had included credible intervals on each of those point estimates, um, another thing you would have seen was that at higher levels of true mortality, um, those credible intervals got wider. So you had more variability at higher levels of true mortality. We also did tend to see that there was a little bit less bias as you went from 0.1 to 0.4 especially, but even when you went from 0.4 to 0.6. Um, so I guess in conclusion, um, I think kind of takeaways are, well, that this is seems to be a good way to look at different receiver configurations if you're thinking about setting up an acoustic telemetry study, um, but also that both these models, spatial and non-spatial, did a fairly good job at estimating mortality, but that you would have to keep in mind if you were to apply this to real data that you tended to have that positive bias um, for the estimates. Um, so that's what I have for today. Um, I didn't feel like I had enough time to go into any of the real data stuff, but obviously that's the next uh, component of my thesis. Um, but with that, I would be happy to take any questions.